I know this guy who people described to me and said that he was quite scary. He was a Ghanaian uh, older chap in London. And when I met him, I was quite worried about what he was going to be like because of the things that people had said to me about him. But actually, as I got to know him, it, my view changed. And I don't know what your view of God is, whether like the title of this message today, whether you view him as as scary or, or nice, or whether you think those are exclusive. I want to, us to discover what does he say about himself and what do we understand of God when we look at his character as displayed in the Bible, in the, the writings that we have. And so I really want to encourage you to be open-minded about what is God like so that you can learn something more about him. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament, it says these words, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. We get similar descriptions of God in the in the New Testament, so both in the beginning of the Bible and at the end of the Bible, we get these pictures of this, this God who is who's awesome and powerful. We were talking last week, if you were uh, watching last week, uh, that God is all powerful, all knowing, and he is everywhere all of the time. It's this awesomeness about him. And yet there's something more than just power and presence and knowledge to the very character of God. But sometimes we can be fearful of that. I guess we want a God, if we believe that God exists, to be a God of justice, because there's much evil that happens in this world, and there's many people who do bad things. And we want there to be ultimately a judge who is right and righteous, and who exercises judgment over people like murderers, rapists, child abusers, etc. And we, we want them to get justice. And, and if there is an eternal life, then we want certainly that there to be a punishment for those people. So we, we want there to be a God who is, who is, who is just. In the Old Testament, we, we hear of this account where there was a society and there just was evil abounding in it. It was just is in a depraved society. It's called Sodom and Gomorrah, these two different uh, cities uh, in, on, in the area of the Dead Sea in, in uh, Israel today is where they, they would have been. And, and they were living in a life that was full of debauchery and displeasing and evil and violent. Uh, and God uh, said that he was going to judge that nation, that, those cities rather, and, and uh, he, he had almost like this conversation with Abraham, one of the early patriarchs. And Abraham was b basically trying to plead for the cities uh, to be saved if there were any righteous people in there. And he starts by saying, if there are 50 people there, would you, would you not bring judgment on them? Well, if there were 45, what about 40? And what about 20? If there were 10 people, would you save them? And, and God said, yes, even if there were 10 righteous people in the city, they wouldn't be judged and experience uh, the, 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 the consequence of judgment. The truth was there weren't 10 people that were righteous in that city, but God saved uh, a family, uh, Lot and his wife and two daughters, and they were able to flee the city. God's heart was to um, enable anybody that was living right to be saved, and, and judgment then poured out on that city and, and they where they are today just it remains a desolate plain um, and so God's this God of justice uh, there's a there's a necessity for justice for judgment to come but is it okay if we want there to be a God of justice a God who judges. Is, is that okay that he brings about punishment on, on those? In the New Testament, it says these words in Romans, the, Paul writing to the Roman church. He says, for all have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. There are two things that we need to understand about judgment is that, that, that everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short of the standard of, of holiness and purity because God is holy, 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 it said in that early passage. And, and it also says um, that the wages in Romans 6, the rate for the wages of sin is death. So if all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, then, then judgment on every person is inevitable. But, uh, and this is a big but, and it's the most important but that you'll hear, really. Matthew chapter 18, it says this, In the same way, Jesus speaking, in the same way your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Jesus gives a description and a picture of the Father, the God who loves every individual. I want to tell you the story of a, a friend of mine, a lady called Teresa, who was working on the Teen Challenge van in Edinburgh. And she was working in a, a suburb of Edinburgh called Drylaw and uh, was with one of the guys who was struggling with uh, addiction and a chaotic lifestyle. And one day, um, they, she just prayed for him and she told me it wasn't a particularly significant prayer. She didn't really remember very much about it. Uh, but later that uh, she, she was told that what she prayed for was that God would show himself to this particular young chap. And we're calling him Joseph Turner. Uh, his name is, is, it's not his real name, but his name is significant. And Joseph Turner goes off and he's, he's, he's not a Christian, he's just living a chaotic life. But one day he goes into uh, the Catholic chapel in Lauriston, another part of the city of Edinburgh. And uh, he sits down in this, in this church and it's just an empty church, there's no service, there's nobody else there. And he's just a bit desperate, he goes in there for quietness and he just picks up the Bible, that's, there's a Bible on, in front of every seat, he picks up the Bible and he opens the cover of the Bible. And inside, on the cover, in the flyleaf of the Bible, is written Joseph Turner, his name. And he is gobsmacked. He cannot understand that. His name is not an everyday name. Uh, and it's a random thing that he would be in this particular church and pick up a Bible. And then his name, his own name, is written on the flyleaf of it. And he tells Teresa this story. He's, he's overcome, really, with emotion, the fact that, that how has this happened? You know how it happens? Because God is interested in every single person and he's interested in you. And it's the same is the case for Joseph. And God was able to orchestrate the random uh, nature of this particular book having uh, his name written on it. So when he picks it up on that particular day, he knew that God revealed himself. Joseph knew that God had revealed himself to him that day. And God wants to reveal himself to you. And if you want to discover God, if you're not yet a Christian, then God wants to reveal himself to you. So why don't you ask him and he will show himself because he so much loves you. How, does, how do we reconcile this picture of, of God who's, who's, who brings about judgment and punishment with this God who loves every single individual? How can those two things be combined? If we see God as the scary judge or, or the, the, the loving father, how do, we, uh, how do we combine those two pictures? In 2 Corinthians, the writer says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, sin is real and demands a punishment. God is just and he's the judge and he needs to, to bring that punishment. He needs to meet out that punishment, give that punishment out because sin demands it. We don't want people to get away with things when they do things bad. And, and, and the same is true. God can't overlook sin because he's holy and he's just. So he initiates a way of reconciling those two things together and he pays the penalty himself 
by coming in the person of Jesus. He's both the judge and the saviour. He's both the one that brings about punishment, but the one who then in turn receives that punishment, takes that punishment on himself so that you don't have to, so that I don't have to. That's amazing. When I had young daughters, they're growing up now, but when I had young daughters, um, I would sometimes need to yell at them to tell them off for doing something that was that was naughty or bad or dangerous. I never stopped loving them, but I had to sometimes discipline them, challenge them, correct them. And the same is true of our loving Father, our Heavenly Father. Sometimes he needs to, as it were, yell at us to get our attention, to tell us what's wrong so that we can turn around and do the right thing. And this is the picture of the God who sometimes seems scary, but actually is really nice. When we understand the offensiveness of sin before a holy God, all the things that I've ever done wrong, they're just they're, they're abhorrent to God, a holy God. He can't look upon those things. So he had to deal with them by taking them away and he places them on Jesus on the cross so that he who was without sin became sin for us and he gives us in turn the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of God is placed on us so we become clean and pure and holy and get a new start. That's amazing. I said to you about the Ghanaian guy and as I got to know him I realised that although some people saw, his, saw him as, as austere and quite scary, um, he's actually the most lovely man and he's got a great sense of humour. I know him really well now, I'd consider him to be a friend. And, and some people maybe would still view him uh, with a bit of uh, uh, and, uh, trepidation in some ways. Uh, but once you get to know him, you, you, uh, you just realise he's, he's really nice. Uh, and how much more important that you get to know God for what he's really like. Not just a perception that you might have, but to truly discover him, that he would reveal himself to you. Whether you're a Christian and you've been walking that walk a long way, sometimes our view is clouded. Over time, we get jaded and we, we forget how much God loves us. And I want you to be reminded today of just that immeasurable love, just that amazing grace, the offensiveness of sin that God has taken away purely because of his amazing grace and his love. And, and if you're not yet a Christian, then I want you to experience what it is to know him as your loving, caring father. And you can do that. I'd love for you to, to connect with me. Uh, follow again the link in the description because I would like to pray with you or give you some literature. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to get to know that God is, well, really, he's both scary and nice. He's scary if you're at a distance from him, but you discover that he just loves you so much. God bless you.